first you've got to copy. I don't know if you've had your coffee and correct grammar yet this morning, but if you haven't, let's get some in you. Today, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give a brief overview of syntax and uh, how that works, how one would syntax something, um, the mechanics behind that. The overall gist of why you would do it because of course you would need a reason to do it right and so once you have a reason to do it then you can learn how to do it and then do it and do it with correctness what is syntax does anybody know out there listening what syntax is of course I've done multiple videos on this so if you're a new viewer, of course, I wouldn't expect you to know that. But if you are a returning or recurring video, I could reasonably expect you to know and be able to give me closure on what syntax is. If someone were asking me this question and putting me on the spot, I know that the best friend for research, the most obvious thing to go to would be Google and just type in syntax definition, maybe. And if you pull that up, it'll say the arrangement of words and phrases to create well-formed sentences in a language. And then there's another one that says a set of rules for or an analysis of the syntax of a language. That's just goofy. Forget that one. <laughs> so syntax is basically the way the words work together to make sense. Basically, that's what it is. And so when someone syntaxes a document in the sense of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, they are basically making sense of what's on the paper because it doesn't make sense. There's no closure as to what's going on in the, on the document. So you, we're just going to say you in the general sense, uh, whatever, as a, you know, being a tutor here, just saying in general, you, go in there and commandeer the vessel and make the syntax, you would have to have knowledge of what it is you're doing. Now, this is a grammar channel. So when you hear me talking here, you're going to hear me talking about grammar. You're not going to hear me sitting here trying to sell a product or something. No, if I say I'm going to talk about grammar, then it's going to be grammar. That's what this channel is. This is not some sort of elaborate advertising scheme to get people to send me money in another venue so then I can teach them. No, that's not what this is. And the reason I can say that is because everything I know about the grammar is on this YouTube channel. I have given it away to the public, everything. If you wanna do a confidential workshop with me, that's a different thing entirely. There is nothing in the workshops that's not on the grammar channel except for your one-on-one -on -one interaction with me. And people seem to learn faster that way. But it's not necessary because I put everything here on the YouTube channel. So anyways, the syntax. When I'm talking about syntax, I'm talking about, again, the commandeering of an adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, fiction, vessel. Let's see if I can pull up an example here of uh, whatever goofiness. Uh. Get a case file out here. All right. Uh, 
this is an example of a document contract postal vessel court venue. with the sing tax key and the syntax document, which I put the syntax key also on here. And also I put the flag up here. So I've commandeered this vessel because I don't have any closure on what it is they're doing on this vessel. And I say such in the document contract, postal vessel court venue and correct sentence structure. Ailing contract. And by ailing, I mean A-I-L. With the I-N-G in brackets because I-N-G is no contract. Um, not A-L-E. A-L-E is no contract. And I don't drink beer. Well, I drink root beer, but not beer. So it's not that one. It's A-I-L, which is positive performance. This is an amicus curi document. And I put a 10 day drogue on it. I ran a 10 day timeline. And the terms and conditions I gave for the vessel was a, te a 10 day communication back or vacation. And this was sent out on June 20th, 2019. And Hold on. They got it on June 24th. And I addressed it to the director of the Selective Service Program in They got it. I got the card back. As they did not communicate back, they vacated their position. My position stood and I vacated all contracts with the military. And I did that by syntaxing the document. So what do you do when you syntax? How do you start syntaxing? Find out what tangible versus non-tangible contract words mean. What a fact-based versus a non-fact-based word means. What that concept is. And once you study and get closure on that, then you can start syntaxing with confidence. Because if you don't have that knowledge, it's going to be a lot harder for you. I find it's harder for people to understand the mechanics of syntax if they don't have that concept under their belt. So what does tangible contract mean? Do you have a tangible contract with something as opposed to a non-tangible contract with something? I have a tangible contract with this cup and the coffee that's in it. I have a tangible contract with love. When I say to you, I love my wife, you know what I'm talking about. You know what love is, because I'm sure that you can relate to that. That there's some sort of condition in your life that you love. Your children, your mother, your father, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your home companions, um, whatever else, your fellow mankind. You know what love is. You have a tangible contract with love. Even though you can't hold it in your hand, it is tangible contract in the same sense that you have a tangible contract with what a cup is. But do you have a tangible contract with what a the is? Yeah, it's a word. Do you have a, con a tangible contract with what an of is? Well, just like the, it's a word, but you don't, there's no really differentiated differentiation between the two so the and of are non-tangible as opposed to cup and love which are tangible 
So that's a brief overview of tangibility versus non-tangibility. Now, if you want to know for sure and have extra certification on whether a word is tangible or non-tangible when you're beginning to syntax a document, you would go into an etymology dictionary and parse the words that you're syntaxing. And I go into this in great detail in multiple videos on my parse playlist. So you would look up the nativity root meanings of the particles of the word you're syntaxing. If you have a tangible contract with the earliest nativity root mean of those particles, then the word that you're syntaxing is going to be tangible contract, which simply means it's going to be a verb, adjective, or a pronoun. If you go to the earliest nativity root mean of the word you're syntaxing and it's non-tangible contract, you don't have a tangible contract with it, then your word you're syntaxing is going to be non-tangible contract and it's either going to be an adverb, verb, or a pronoun. So this is basic consistent process of elimination. You can use these techniques across the board. They will work every time. Same techniques I use, same techniques uh, the students that I've taught that have closure on it, same techniques they use. So it's consistent across the board. There is no different style. It's one thing across the board that everybody can be consistent with. Because we can give closure to it. If you can't give closure to what it is you're doing, the syntax values you're banking, because make no mistake, you are banking value. You are a bank banker when you syntax. You're putting value to a word, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or zero. Well, in zero, you wouldn't be putting a value to it. But in any case, so you are a banker. So you have to know what you're doing if you're a banker. If you don't know what you're doing, I mean, you yourself cannot possibly be a bank banker and have any kind of credibility if someone says to you, hey, why did you, why does this adverb modify this adverb? Why are there two ones in a row in your syntax? And then you say, well, because Russell said that's the way it's done. I highly doubt they're going to accept that as, a, as closure. But if you can give closure as to why it happens that way from yourself, it's more convincing, especially if you know what you're talking about. But of course, I don't know anyone who can explain that scenario because to me, an adverb would never modify another adverb. And I give closure to that in multiple videos as well. So when someone asks you to give closure on the syntax pattern that you that you bank and you can give them closure on it, well, then you're the authority. You know what you're talking about. Even if they don't know what you're talking about, they know you know what you're talking about. And it's a whole different ballgame then. Whole different ballgame. Hello there. Um, it's easy to parse, my friend. Just pull up etymologyonline.com, type in the word love, and you will get closure on it. You can even go on Google. Just Google. Type in uh, love etymology or etymology of love, and it'll come right up. You'll be able to see what it is. So I like to offer these things, and in the same sense, I also prefer it if people if people can do something on their own, I would prefer that they do it because people learn a lot quicker if they do if they put the work in themselves. So I can guess that maybe, okay, it's one of two things. Either you don't know the parse of the word love and you want me to do it for you, or you have already done it. And you want to compare it with what I came up with. 
So if you could clarify what that way you want me to parse the word love, um, we can move forward with that. So once you come into the first technique, and that is determining if you have closure on what tangible versus non-tangible is, then you would go to the end of a sentence or a word group and work backwards. I found through you know almost five years of teaching that this is the most efficient and effective way to syntax. Less mistakes are made by beginners by going backwards. And there are also some neat little techniques you can use that make it a lot more, a lot easier. Let's put it that way, going backwards. Why from and to or past and future? I don't understand it. Rare visionists, have you considered studying those words in a fiction dictionary and finding out and looking at the tenses simply googling the phrase what tense is the word to and put two in brackets google will tell you what tense it is and give you examples of how that would work this is stuff that's right at your fingertips i mean you don't need me to do it i can tell you but I would definitely prefer it if you did it yourself. Like if you parse the word to, it will it will come to you <laughs> what it is, right? So since you said you don't understand why to is future tense. So if you parse the word to, uh, it gives you the the meanings of from Old English in the direction of, for the purpose of, furthermore. Okay, now cognize what that sensation is to you. What what does that mean to you? Proto Indo Indo European pronominal base do to toward upward as long as as far as to toward Middle English to and fro so I guess in an overall general overarching sense of the word if I was to think about it logically without even having parsated or studying it, just thinking about the way it's used in adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun. Two, if you're, if you're in one place, like this is the now space right here, you wouldn't be going to anywhere because you're only right here. And if you're on a straight line, this being the past and this being the future, and you're here, if you're going to somewhere, you're going into the future. If you're coming from somewhere, it's the past. That's the best way I can put it logically without going into a big uh, discussion about it. So, the uh, I am correct. I am correct about what? What is the reason you want me to parse the word love? Number Is it number one because... You haven't done it yourself, or is it number two because you want to compare your uh, your parse with my parse? Everything is quite simple. Rare visionist, I found this this grammar simplifies everything. So to get back to the syntaxing, so where are we at? We're at the end of the sentence. I'm going to put a sentence in the chat real quick here. And we'll syntax this sentence.
This is going to be a goofy sentence, but uh, check it out. The sentence I'm syntaxing is the lizardly demon darkly. The lizardly demon darkly. Does anyone want to take a shot at syntaxing that sentence? The lizardly demon darkly. I don't know if that shows up backwards or not. So going by what I just told you. Where do we begin with syntaxing this sentence? Using the techniques I just shared with you and I just taught you. What's the first thing we do to syntax this sentence? Anybody? Anybody have any uh, any ideas of where we would start and what we would do first? We would start from the end. Okay. Uh, so it's number two. That's the reason you want me to parse the word love, number two. Well, then first I would ask you to share what you came up with with your parse. And then I will share mine. Okay? So that I'm sure that you know what you're talking about. Because this is not a geometric level playing field, this comments and video and things like that. So we got to level it any way we can. And establish knowledge. So I have to establish your knowledge that you know what you're talking about, about love. So if you please share your part, say, in, in the meaning you got out of it. And then I will definitely share mine. So yes, we start at darkly. And is darkly tangible or non-tangible? Rare visionist. Is darkly tangible or non-tangible? We are not parsing. I mean, we are, but we're. This is not. This is we're syntaxing. So in this, in the, use that as a frame of context for what we're doing here. Whether DE means no or not is not going to affect the tangibility or non-tangibility of demon. Okay, I mean, demon means no man, right? It would mean that, but that does not affect tangibility or non-tangibility in this sense. So as far as the love thing, the parse with the love, you have L-O hyphen V-E. Are you claiming that love is two syllables? Because I've never seen that. I've only ever seen love as one particle, L-O-V-E. Even back to grade school when you would talk about syllables, um, like the word Jason, J-son. That's two syllables, J-son. Love. Love is one syllable, one particle in this context of parse. So right off the bat, I would say, um, I mean, you can parse it every, any way you want to, but by the mechanics I use, I'm, I usually go by syllables and love is one particle in and of itself. And if you look in your etymology dictionary, you will see this to be true. Correct, rare visionist. Demon is tangible in the same sense that God is tangible, right? So we have two tangible contract words. And then we have lizardly. Is lizardly tangible contract or non-tangible contract? Now we have enough information to begin syntaxing. So let's begin syntaxing. We have darkly, which is non-tangible. We have demon, which is tangible. And we have lizardly, which is non-tangible. What syntax value from the syntax key 
would you bank on darkly? Is darkly an adverb, a verb, an adjective, a pronoun, a positional, a lodial, a fact, past tense, future tense, or conjunction? What is it? Is it a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine? Does anybody know why sentences would only end on pronouns or verbs in the fiction babble? Does anybody know? And Cain, no, demon is not a verb in this sentence. Demon is not a verb in this sense. Demon is an adjective. Does anybody know why sentences would only end on twos or fours? Or conversely, to put it in a negative condition of state, why wouldn't a sentence end in an adverb or an adjective, in a one or a three? Why wouldn't a sentence end on an adverb or an adjective? Scott Hilmer, what do you mean by statement of fact? What's a statement of fact? There are no facts in this sentence that we're syntaxing because of the five syntax scenarios. Well, <laughs> That's a clever answer, but that's not closure as to why. The closure on why is that what, what are, first you have to know what adverbs, verbs, adjectives, and pronouns are, what each one is, what condition of state do they represent? If you're looking at adverbs and adjectives, those are modifiers. So the reason they wouldn't come at the end of a sentence is because there's nothing left to modify. They would only precede a word. They would never end a sentence. So a sentence would either end on a verb or on a pronoun because adverbs and verbs, or I'm sorry, adverbs and adjectives are modifiers, the two modifiers, okay? That's why. So to continue on, we have darkly, which is a non-tangible contract pronoun. We have demon, which is tangible contract adjective. So now what is lizardly? We, we said that lizardly was non-tangible. So what syntax value would you bank on lizardly? Is lizardly, and, and because it's non-tangible contract, it's either going to be an adverb, a verb, or a pronoun. It's not going to be an adjective. Tangible contract words will not be adverbs. And non-tangible contract words like lizardly will not be adjectives. Revisionist. I might have to take the star off your report card. A verb. Revisionist, you brought up the five syntax scenarios. Please show me which syntax scenario has a two, three in it. Show me which of the five syntax patterns has a verb followed by an adjective. Show me. In other words, no, <laughs> literally is not a verb. Because a verb would never precede an adjective. So by process of elimination, knowing the five syntax patterns, which, you know, if you're a beginner, it's forgivable. I mean, you may not have them memorized. So in the five syntax patterns, we know that there's not going to be a two, three ever. So we know that. So we know that 
non-tangible contract words will not be adjectives. So we know that. So we know it's not a two. We know it's not a three. We know that there's no four, three scenario. So lizardly cannot be a four. So through process of elimination, as Ray Vision has said, it's an adverb. So darkly is non-tangible contract pronoun, demon, tangible contract adjective, and lizardly is non-tangible contract adverb. So then, because we're going backwards, and this is the neat technique that I'm talking about that makes things easier for beginners when learning syntax, is because we're going backwards, when you certify that you hit an adverb, now you can take that entire section out. You're done with it. And you're left with one word. The. Is the tangible or non-tangible? But actually, in this case, it doesn't matter whether it's tangible or non-tangible if it's standing by itself, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter because any word standing by itself is a what? Any word standing by itself is a what? Any term, any hieroglyph by itself is a what? Pronoun. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, I put the star back up there. So we have the syntax scenario of 4134. Pronoun. And we know that a pronoun is any term standing alone or... Nothing can follow a pronoun except for what? A break in the continuance of the evidence or an adverb. So this follows that rule. Lizardly is an adverb. Nothing can follow a pronoun except for an adverb or a break in the continuance of the evidence. For one, adverbs modify adjectives and adverbs modify verbs. And in this case, it's tangible contract demon because it's followed by non-tangible contract darkly at the end of the sentence, which is now a pronoun being colored by adjective demon. There we go. There's your syntax class. There's some valuable content, my gift to you, to help clarify your cognition of these mechanics. And what I'm going to do now, which I wanted to do at the beginning, is uh, briefly go over what the syntax values are. You, you have to know what they are in order to bank them, right? You have to know what an adverb is. You have to know what a verb is. You have to have, know what an adjective is, and you have to know what a pronoun is. So in order to you, – you have to be able to convey this closure to someone else, another contract party in the now space – with patience, kindness, firmness, and confidence. Because if they know that you don't know what you're talking about, it's all over. I mean, it's all over. You have to know what you're talking about. So adverb is just pure modification. And if you look at the video, Closure and Clarity on Two Specific Syntax Scenarios, Part 2, I give closure to these parts of speech in that video. And also I made a specific special video on the adverb in my parts of speech playlist. So you can check that out for more closure. But an adverb is just pure modification. It's like a, it's a non-tangible concept. That's why adverbs are non-tangible and would not be tangible. So then what is a verb? Verb is the thinking. It's thinking. A verb, an adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, fiction, babble would only occur if it's being modified by an adverb. So if you see a two, there's going to be a one in front of it. So in that segment, 
in that pattern, in that scenario, there's only going to be one verb modified by an adverb. What is an adjective? An adjective is also a modifier. The difference between adjective and adverb in this sense is that adjective is tangible contract modifier. It's a colorer. I use the word color to differentiate it from adverb modifier, but they're both modifiers. And an adjective, in the same sense that an adverb modifies verbs, adjectives modify pronouns. And a pronoun can be either tangible or non-tangible in the same sense that a verb can either be tangible or non-tangible. So overall, adverbs modify adjectives and verbs. Adjectives modify other adjectives and pronouns. And what is a pronoun? As a pronoun can be either tangible or non-tangible, it's representative of any concept or word in the, in the language. Just like in the fiction language, pronouns are, are seen as he, she, it, they, I, you, me. It's representative of something. If I say me, it's representative of Jason. So I'd take that concept and just blow it up into a bigger proportion for correct sentence structure. A pronoun is any word in the English language that's standing by itself or being colored by an adjective. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, syntax lesson. I wanted to put some valuable syntax content out there and actually show people how to syntax in a live setting. Number one, so that you know that I know what I'm talking about. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, how can you teach other people how to do things? If, uh, if you're interested in fast tracking your learning, email me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. And what I'll do is I'll first set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation so you and I can vet each other and see if this is, if this is what you want to do or see if you even want to be taught by me or, in, you know, vice versa. And then uh, apply for the workshop. And then after that, uh, we can move forward with the details of how that would happen. Otherwise, there's over 300 videos on this YouTube channel. There's nothing secret or hidden or classified. All my knowledge has been poured out into these videos. I spent thousands of hours creating them. What we just went over in this video right here, I've repeated on this channel multiple, multiple times in different ways. So it's all out there. It's all there for you if you want it. And of course, you know, if you want to email me to fast track your learning, do it and we'll set it up. Thank you very much for participating. As usual, I'll probably go back and edit this to uh, edit out the violent cat fight and uh, just keep the grammar stuff in there. Andres says, I have a question. Go ahead. Ask your question. I got it. I'll give you a couple minutes. Ask a question. If it has to do with the grammar, I'll definitely answer it. If it has to do with something else, I may not, but go ahead and go ahead and ask. How would the procedure of getting closure with the alphabet look like? How would the procedure of getting closure with the alphabet look like? I'm not sure I understand your question, Andre. I believe you've stated in the past how one would get their own closure with the actual letters of the alphabet. Well, to the best of my knowledge of what you're asking, uh, to get close, how would the procedure of getting closure on the alphabet look like? I would look up each letter and look up the etymology of each letter and the roots of where it comes from in an etymology dictionary or Latin dictionary or any kind of dictionary, Sanskrit dictionary. Just look up each letter if that's what you're, what you want to do. That's how. I think it would look like. How do you think it would look like?
See, I do things on an as-needed basis, and I do go into how one parses each letter of a word when the word is spread out, when you have like A, space, space, M, space, space, E, space, space, so on and so forth. Then you can syntax each letter individually, and you would have to just like you look up any particle, which I give closure to in my parse playlist, you find out whether they're tangible or non-tangible. So that's what the procedure would look like. That is what the procedure would look like. The same way you would parse words is the same way you would parse letters, Andre. Well, that's the way I do it. You may do it differently. Um, this letter C would be a contract letter. Letter U would be no contract letter. Um, I would use the words tangible contract and non-tangible contract because everything is contract. You do have a contract with the letter U. Otherwise, you wouldn't be using it. You see what I'm saying? But if you say non-tangible contract, it means, yes, you do have a contract with the letter U, it's just not tangible in the same way that the letter C is tangible or the letter B is tangible. Where you have U and then you have C, B, A, I, you see? But again, I go into great depth of closure on that in the video. Closure and clarity on two specific syntax scenarios, part two. I give closure on that. Um, misuse of words. I guess I'm not sure what you mean by that. It's not really misusing it um, because you can use words however you want to. What it comes down to in that context is the volition. If I'm trespassing on you, I'm not misusing words. That's your opinion. I'm using words to trespass on you, to hurt you, to harm you in some way. It's not a misuse. It's a malicious volition. Or it could be a nasty volition. Maybe I don't know I'm hurting you. But still, misuse is sort of is, a, is an opinion. I'm using words. I'm not not using them because misuse means no, not to use. I am using words. Does that make sense? <laughs> what I'm trying to do, my friend, is to bring the psychology back into it. Um, the psychology of, like David Wynn Miller said in the one video, and, you know, Russell has used the same technique. When I do this, what is happening? What happened there? And then someone from the crowd will say, you dropped the pen. And then they'll say, no, that you can't do that. That's a trespass. You're trespassing on me. You can't tell me what I'm doing. You can't tell me what I'm doing. All you can do is be a witness as to what you saw, the pen going from here to here. And if it caused you damage, then you give voice to what damage it caused you. How that hurt you. How did this pen falling from, or, I'm sorry. How did this pen going from point A to point B hurt you? Show me on the chart where it hurt you. <laughs> you know, and then you create a document contract, postal vessel court venue. You syntax, commandeer the vessel, postal mechanics, bank mechanics, flag mechanics, grammar mechanics. And you go from there. All right. Thanks, everybody. This was a good one. I appreciate everybody who participated. And uh, Rave Visionist, congratulations on your star, man. Appreciate your participation. Hope this helped everybody. Have a good one. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it provided some clarity on the subjects mentioned. You can email me at the email address that's uh, been screened at the bottom of your picture for the whole video, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. If you have any grammar questions, 
or if you wish to participate in a 10 to 15 minute video consult, or if you wish to apply for a Correct Grammar workshop, you can email me there. Uh, please like and subscribe to this channel and also my Coral Blade Grotto channel if you'd like. And always remember that authority comes from knowledge and the skill in conveying that knowledge and closure. Thanks.